The agenda this week delved into the enduring mysteries of two Ontario millionaires, debated Indigenous ownership of pipelines, and assessed what Canada needs to do in its foreign policy dealings with China. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with a look at women in engineering, 30 years after the Montreal Massacre. Joining us now on the line from Montreal, Quebec, Nathalie Provo. She is a survivor of the Montreal Massacre and now a regional director with the Quebec government's Ministry of Sustainable Development, Environment and Fight Against Climate Change. And Nathalie, uh, while we absolutely hate the anniversary that has brought you to be a part of our discussion here tonight, we are pleased that you were able to find some time uh, for us because uh, we were saying off the top of our conversation here, there are lots of people watching this right now who either weren't in Canada then or are too young to remember it and therefore need to know what happened. So let's start there. Where were you when the attack happened? Oh. I was in the first, first classroom where uh, Marc Lépine began to uh, shot women in Polytechnic 20, 30 years ago. And um, we were so surprised and amazed at something. I, I think we didn't really realize what was happening. And he divided the class. He asked the boys to leave it. And all the girls stayed uh, together. And I don't know how a small conversation began with him, but I, he, he told us that um, he was there because we were feminists uh, from his point of view, and he hated feminists. And I remember answering him back that we were not feminists and that if he wants to study in Polytechnic, he can come with us. I don't think my, um, I was able to finish that sentence, and he began to shut. And it was a really, uh, a really quick massacre. Uh, we were all close one from the other. <laughs> Sorry, I moved because it's like, it's it's, it's like I'm there. And um, and then he was gone from the class, and I was there, and I didn't understood what had just happened, but I knew that I was the. I just died in a, in, a, in a certain kind of way. Um, it was the beginning of a, an extraordinary long evening that only ended the day after. And uh, at that time, I didn't know exactly what was going on. But we learned the day after that mm -hmm. Maclipin had killed 14 women in Polytechnic. And I was among the 14 person who had been shot. What injuries did you sustain, Natalie? I was uh, shot at each leg in my forehead, and I had a piece of a bullet that came into my left foot. Do you still suffer physical health effects because of that? Um, in a strange way, yes, but it's... The sense of your question, I haven't lose any capacity, any ability to move after because of the uh, of the massacre, because of it. But uh, as I grow old, my scars and my wounds begin to hurt again uh, because the flesh is tighter. We are not as supple as I I was not. I'm not as supple as I was two, three, five days, uh, five years ago. Sorry, I'm pretty tired today. I'm just coming from Polytechnic, and I may sometime have difficulty finding my words. So, yes, right now I feel uh, my, uh, my injuries. It's not important. It's not very uh, disturbing. But I know they are there still. Hmm. Natalie, we have videotape from the day. And this is what you said. 30 years ago, Shelton, if you would, roll the clip. What I tell, told them is that we're just, we're, we are just women who study in engineer, who study in, enge, in engineering. We don't fight to prove that we are women. We don't fight to prove that we are best of the men. And after I have told him that, maybe he answers something, but 
I, I, I didn't understand because he began to shut us. Natalie, I have to say, you, you look incredibly resilient in that interview, despite what you have just gone through. Do you remember, uh, I mean, how, do you remember that moment and do you remember feeling particularly strong? Because you sure looked very strong in that moment. I think it's one of the most amazing moment of my life. I remember it really clearly. And I also remember how calm I felt, how peaceful with myself I was. I knew I was doing the right thing at the right moment. Uh, but it moves me a lot to see me or to hear me like that because I'm so young. <laughs> what were you, were you 18 then or how old? 23. 23. Yeah, <laughs> but you shouldn't have asked because now everybody knows how old I am now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we're doing the math in our heads right now. All right, well, I asked you a moment ago about physically what the after effects were and you explained that. And um, I'm now going to ask you the obvious follow-up question, which is you're doing a lot of interviews about this anniversary. You have visited the spot of this terrible tragedy. Um, emotionally, how are you today? Oh, um, uh, I don't know how I did it, but I know that I've been uh, I've been some, through something like the uh, post-traumatic syndrome process to heal. Um, I, can, I can look at it with a certain distance to feel comfortable and almost to feel like if it has been something happening to somebody else than myself. Canada's got to decide whether Huawei ought to be allowed to bid on this infrastructure. The US, Australia, New Zealand, have apparently banned Huawei from doing so. Half of Canadians surveyed say to be a mistake to allow them to bid on it. What sort of a threat do you believe a Huawei 5G system in Canada would pose to Canadians? The debate has, has begun to center around issues like country of origin. So the question becomes, because a company like Huawei is situated in China, and because of the, the complicated relationship that the US now and of course Canada have with China, that therefore uh, the trustworthiness of, of a vendor then is now being called into question. Uh, and Huawei happens to be the, the leader, one of the global leaders in 5G technology. So Huawei obviously now has become uh, a target um, in the US uh, and, and, and among uh, other allies uh, to ban it from 5G networks. I think the, the complicating issue is that there's two, there, there are two sides of this debate. One is that, you, that, that the technical solutions can be found for some of the security issues around 5G. Um, and then the other side holds that you have to take into account that country of origin and the political and legal system in that country uh, when you're considering uh, the overall uh, 5G, your, your posture on 5G. So I think that's where we are in this debate. And it's tough because, you know, there's, there are, there are, there's no exclusive proof or definitive proof that Huawei uh, has, has taken action uh, on behalf of the Chinese government. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there. Um, and if you talk to technical people and carriers, they, they, they uh, in, in places like the UK and Germany, they believe, and even in Canada, I think the Canadian, one of the Canadian intelligence services believes that the technical issues can be managed. It's about risk management. So the question is, do, does that risk management include the country and, and the nature of the regime in the country? And that's sort of where we're stuck right now. Um, and each country is making a decision around that, um, how to treat the country and the country of origin. Okay, that seems like the right question to ask. So Richard, if risk management is what it's about, one of the things we need to know is is how intertwined Huawei, Huawei Canada, and the Chinese government, how intertwined those three things are. What do you see? I think they're very intertwined. I mean, I think you have to start from the premise that any, any entity originating out of China is subject to the direction of the Communist Party. Uh, and if they issue directions to Huawei or Huawei Canada, directly or indirectly, I think they'll be followed. But to the point that, that Paul just made, I'd, like, I'd just like to add a slight twist to things. I think it's feasible that today our experts could take uh, Huawei 5G equipment and render it impervious to Chinese intelligence assaults. The problem that worries me is that give the Chinese five years and they'll find a way around it. So I'm rather more in favor of preventative medicine than curative medicine. 
Uh, I know there are different views on this, but the Chinese intelligence services have proven themselves to be very sophisticated, very technically oriented, and Chinese law is very clear. If they want a Chinese company to intervene on their behalf anywhere in the world, they have the legal obligation to do so. And to put it in context, you'll remember that a few years ago, American subsidiaries were forbidden to trade with, with uh, Cuba. So if a country as benign as the United States can force its subsidiaries to, to do what it wishes to do, imagine what subsidiaries of a Chinese company would do. Margaret, I'll follow up by actually, I have the quote here of what the law says. The Chinese statute clearly says, as it relates to Chinese companies, they must, quote, support, cooperate with, and collaborate in national intelligence work. Does that suggest to you that if Huawei finds something out about Canada that would be helpful to the authoritarian government, they got to do it. They got to pass it along. It does. The language is shall do it. Mm -hmm. And there's a second part to that uh, section of the act, and that is that they will also be obliged to keep that secret. So whatever they're doing in their intelligence work on behalf of the party there to keep it secret. Um, Huawei tries to present itself as a public company, uh, a private, sorry, private company, mm -hmm. um, privately owned. It's actually 1% owned by Meng Wanzhou's father. The other 99% is owned by trade union committee, and no one knows who's on that committee, uh, but for sure there will be party members on it, and trade union committees report further up to a bigger trade union committee re which reports to the party. Hmm. So that's who owns the company. Greg, I wonder if you could talk to us about whether you believe there's a double standard going on here. We know that there are some Silicon Valley companies, <clears throat> excuse me, that have close relationships with uh, American government officials. Uh, you might even want to say that there's uh, an interesting relationship between the government of Canada and SNC-Lavalin. Maybe not as close as uh, some people in those two entities would like, but what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think part of the challenge of the current situation is we, we don't have a set of rules that everyone uh, you know, is the play by as far as the global competition in, in these new sectors. And what is the relationship exactly between governments and companies, the relationship between state and markets? And we know that in the case of the United States, for example, Silicon Valley received a lot of funding from the US government too, in its origins. And there's obviously relations between um, the two. Of course, we tend to think of the United States as a more entrepreneurial, business-driven society, and we're comfortable with that. In the case of China, it's unclear exactly what is the relationship between Huawei and the Chinese government at times. We had expected as an industry to have Keystone Excel. Uh, we thought there was going to be a Northern Gateway. There was going to be a Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. There was going to be a Line 3 expansion. And a lot of these projects have been stalled for, for various reasons. In the well, case of Northern Gateway, can't, can't canceled. Blame, yeah, you can't blame Trudeau for, for Keystone XL. <laughs> No, that was but, Obama. But but the reality is, this takeaway capacity is is the constraint. And so when you ask, you know, is this a good purchase? As we access markets, we access better prices, and 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 it becomes a good good business opportunity. Certainly a benefit to our members. Hmm. The it, problem I have please. with that though is, I hear constraint. You know, these these constraints of being able to take away Keystone XL, Line Three, uh, you know, all of these different hmm. routes. Um, the constraint is the rights of indigenous people, the rights of indigenous nations. We are the ones that are on the front lines fighting these projects. So it's not necessarily some economic constraint or even blaming Obama. Obama actually, you know, recognized indigenous rights in that particular scenario and the rights of communities of color, poor communities who are disproportionately impacted by these pipelines. The problem companies should be asking is why are you routing it disproportionately through communities of color, through communities that are have less access to economic power and even legal authority and power in, in these countries. So if the route were changed, would that be more satisfactory? Well, I'd like to see it maybe go through the most affluent neighborhoods in Canada and the United States. And then, yeah, maybe it would change a little bit. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'd have your takeaway routes. Do you have a point there? Uh, I don't think that's true. If you look at the Northern Gateway project, that was a project where a third of the assets was going to be owned by indigenous uh, communities. The pipeline itself, the terminal, uh, it was kind of new from that standpoint, breaking ground and with the Aboriginal Equity Partners Group. It's true that the court case was about uh, consultation, and, and that's because Canada's learning to get consultation right, and we've learned a lot of things through, through these court cases. 
In the case of Line 3, I was just at a presentation yesterday that Enbridge gave in partnership with the, the local First Nations, talking about the work they've done together, educating their non-Indigenous workforce, and then partnering on the life cycle of the project. The court cases that are holding up that case in the U.S. are, I don't, are not Indigenous-focused. So I, don't, I think it's not a simple thing to say um, the reason for this is, is Indigenous holdup. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, one, one important uh, aspect that gets lost in all this is that there's 130 First Nations that produce oil and gas. And how have they been harmed by the loss in, in, uh, in revenues? So revenues have gone down, fees uh, and royalties collected mm -hmm. on First Nations lands have gone down from 250 million down to 50 million. Now, you can oh. say, well, that's that, it's not it's kind of a big number, but there's not that many people involved. So if you actually do the math, per family of six, they've lost $19,000 per family. Now, $19,000 per family to any Canadian family is, is really important. Mm -hmm. But to families who are fighting poverty, trying to lift themselves out, these things happen without, without their knowledge. It's can, just gone. Can I ask you the flip side of that, though, which is how, what do you see as being the particular risks for the Indigenous investors, whoever ends up winning this pipeline? Well, the reason this, this really works is, is, uh, is that between industry and uh, people like Project Reconciliation is we'll sign take or pay contracts with the pipeline. So as a shipper, we'll say, over the next 10 years, I'm going to ship this volume, this volume of oil. That gives people like uh, Delbert certainty when they go to get uh, financing. And uh, this has been done before. It's not new. So is that to say that there is minimal risk for his investors? There's minimal risk for his investors. Minimal yeah. risk. Do you see it that way as well? Exactly. It's a, it's, <clears throat> it's a win-win all the way around. You know, like we're, we're not asking for taxpayers' money to, you know, to make the investment. To us, it, you know, <clears throat> it's unfortunate, you know, the, um, that back in... What was it, 53, when the uh, when Transvon was first built? You know that there was no consultation back then, right? Uh, it's fortunate uh, that you have, you know, um, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and 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 our relatives, you know, that are blockading and protesting that has created the awareness and created a platform for Indigenous ownership, you know, for consultation to ensure that this happens. I don't take anything of that away. To me. You know, it doesn't matter where the where 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 the uh, pipeline, you know, what what the what the route is, but it's the respect, it's the relationship and understanding of that, right? And how do we and how we reach out? It's it's not, but when we look back to our well, hang on a sec, hang on a sec. Yeah. You say it doesn't matter to you, but it matters to her. Yeah, well, it, it it doesn't because it's all about ensuring that whoever needs to be spoken to, you know, the, whoever whoever needs to be consulted is consulted. 100 years ago today, December 2nd, 1919, what happened? So he has got the final paperwork sorted out the day before, December 1st. He wakes up December 2nd, goes back to the theater to just finish up a few things, pops out for a shave, meets his wife and lawyer for lunch. At some point that day, he deposits a check for a million dollars in the bank. Um, and then his lawyer comes by at 5.30 p.m., picks up his payment for the deal, and he's the last person we know of that sees Ambrose Small alive. Uh, his wife was expecting him home for dinner at 6.30 p.m. in their Rosedale mansion, and when he doesn't show up, she starts to get worried. And the interesting thing is that Ambrose was known to not show up. He's a bit of a known carouser. Um, he has a mistress, and his wife knows about it. So layered through all of this intrigue is a very complicated personal life, too. And nobody saw him after that? There were claims. Like, people would say, oh, I saw Ambrose on Young Street. He was, you know, being held down in the backseat of a car. There were dozens of people who claimed to have seen Ambrose, but no reputable sightings that police could ever confirm. Why do you think his disappearance took on such mythic proportions? I think it's because he was a man already of, of great mythology. Um, as he rose to prominence, he got a reputation for being a very vindictive, mean-spirited guy, always out to win, always out to make money. So he was this towering figure, and he was known to not treat people very well. And so he was also a guy that, I think in Toronto at that time, he was our, he was our sort of millionaire. We were, I think the city was very proud that this guy at the center of all this, even if he's a bit of a, you know, not such a nice guy, 
he was someone who was making it happen. Uh, he was this entrepreneurial guy, and he lived in a mysterious, mysterious ways all the time. He was always being very secretive about business deals. So when he went missing, people knew that he had a lot of enemies, and people knew that there were a lot of people who, you know, might want to get that money from him. And so, you know, it, it became quite a, it became quite a hunt and, a, and an obsession. So Harry Oakes was a guy who grew up in Maine, and from a very young age, he was obsessed with the idea of finding gold. He was um, not a great student in, in school. He was um, somebody who didn't quite know what he wanted to do for a period. He studied medicine at one stage. He heard about the gold rush in the Yukon. And so in 1897, he went to the Yukon, too late for the Klondike, but he spent the next 15 years scrambling his way around the world, sort of chasing gold in all the different gold rushes in Australia, in South Africa. And then he finally, he gets to Northern Ontario because he hears there's been a mineral rush up there. And he almost sort of by chance, he, he hears this news, but he also hears that there are, there's an area around Kirkland Lake that uh, where there are some claims that have already been made that are expiring and that he has a chance to go for it. And he's enough of a geologist to know that the rock there really has potential, that it's carrying, carrying gold. And uh, he stakes the claim, claims on a night where it's minus 52 degrees <laughs> in, the, in January uh, 1912. And uh, he, he's right. There's gold in, in them there ro There's rocks. There's gold in them there rocks. Got it. Now, I mean, I learned from your book that other books have been written about this guy. Movies have been made about this guy. What made you think there was something more to tell about this guy that hadn't already been told? Well, what, of course, mesmerized people for a long time was that he was murdered in the Bahamas and the murder's never been solved. And gradually over the years, two things sort of emerged as the story about Harry Oakes. The first one was the brutal murder, which has never been solved. And the second thing was, that he was a really nasty, nasty piece of work. Mm. And um, as his first biographer wrote, he deserved to die. And I came at it from a different point of view. I wanted to know how did he get to be the richest man in the British Empire? And why does he, has he left such a negative image? And I was particularly interested because, as you know, I'm actually sort of by nature a historian. And I'm always looking for incidents or people who can take me and take readers into part of Canadian history. And I wanted to write about mining in Canada. And Harry's career allowed me to explore the um, Ontario gold rush. I'd already explored the Yukon gold rush, which of course everybody knows about because of Jack London and Robert Service and Pierre Burton. Um, and that's the one we have romanticized in our imagination. The Ontario gold rush of the early 20th century was, depending on sort of how you date it, between 10 and 20, 20 times larger than the Yukon hmm. gold rush in well, the amount of gold produced. You slipped something into the middle of that answer that I don't want to let just slip by. You said he was the richest man in the British Empire. Not just the richest man in Canada, the richest man in the British Empire. What, at the height of his power, what was he worth? Well, he was worth in, um, back then, at least 200 million, which was hugely more than that by today, in so today's he's, standards. So he's a multi-billionaire multi, multi today's Multi, multi-billionaire. Now, was he really the richest man in the British Empire, as the newspapers always like to tag him? I don't know, because there were certainly some pretty rich people in Britain at mm -hmm. the stage. But that was how he was always described. And that tag followed him through life. And that is just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, that's tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, that's twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.